Welcome everybody to another edition of Amplify Your Business. Today we're down here with Kim Heron from the Little Blue Fiber Studio. Did I get that right? You did, yeah. Hey, awesome. <laughs> So we're down here in this beautiful store. We have all this incredible yarn and wool and so on scattered throughout. And also you have on the back wall here uh, felt and the, some of the felt art that you have is just absolutely incredible. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, I didn't even know that was a thing. So my mom, you know, I grew up with my mom knitting and creating all sorts of really cool things. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, this felt art is really, really neat. That That's uh, something that's kind of new, is it? A new trend or? Um, yeah, it's just becoming more and more popular. Um, so for somebody who owns a yarn store, I'm not the biggest knitter or crocheter. I can, it's just never really been my thing, um, but I love felting. And so um, I carry a ton of roving, so they're called roving or roping, where it's okay. the essentially the dyed combed tops of um, you know, sheep or even cotton silks, things like that. And um, using either a special felting needle or even soap or water, um, depending what uh, method of felting you're doing, you can create create felt. Yeah. And so you can do landscapes, you can do um, little critters, or I have like a bunch of the donuts you've seen. Well, yeah, yeah, right over donuts. here. So we have, uh, <laughs> we have all sorts of crazy donuts yeah. in here. These are all felted uh, kits, yeah. which is really neat. So it's, um, yeah, it's something that um, I've become quite well known for here because yeah. I do carry a lot of those supplies just because that's yeah. um, that's my passion. Yeah. But um, but also certainly tons of yarn, um, tons of needles, things like that for sure. Okay, so yeah. let's get into the backstory then. So yes. you started this business then. In the Mar pandemic. Yeah, yeah March 6th? Well, Is that so what you said? I quit my job. I had been in health and safety for about the last 10 years yeah. um, as an occupational hygienist, and I actually left my job to do this. Um, it had always been sort of um, a dream of mine to open a little yarn store. Yeah. And I quit my job March 6th of 2020. And um, two weeks later, everything shut down. Yeah. And then two weeks later, uh, my partner and I, we found out we were pregnant as well. So it was just everything all at once. So I actually ended up having to postpone because everything was shut down. Yeah. Um, so I didn't actually open until the middle of June of 2020, but yeah. this entire pandemic, um, I started a business, all my customers who are incredible, I know from the eyes up. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's been really amazing. Um, but it's been, it's been a, pretty crazy trip for sure yeah, yeah. to open during a pandemic but at yeah. the same time may not have been the worst business idea either because I've gotten um, tons of wonderful customers that I may not have otherwise if it weren't for the pandemic. So, yeah because yeah, so they're I've at home fortunate. looking for things yeah, to do right? Exactly so. so I've been fortunate in that sense for yeah. sure. Yeah yeah, yeah it's like anything right it's a double-edged sword there's uh, opportunity on every on the flip side of every challenge and exactly. so yeah the opportunity was that you had a kind of a captive audience in the sense that where they wanted or needed to do something at home yep. uh, where before they would have been a lot more distracted and yeah. so yeah that's yeah, really exactly. really good um, now in terms of the business itself though so it's been two years yep, almost so I go. guess it'll be June yep. will be two years right for the business and so you've been growing then fairly steadily throughout the pandemic yeah yeah, yeah and so totally. how did you do that then like how did you reach your audience what was the key yeah there? Um, you know and it's been a huge learning curve for me and I'm still yeah. learning a lot um, you know social media media has been has been great because again it's yeah. one of those things that's accessible to most people and it's um, you know it's, it's free for small businesses it's it's really great to use yeah. um, there's it's still a huge learning curve like I mean I'm just discovering I'm sure as, as some people who follow me know I've just discovered reels <laughs> so I'm working on that but um, but it's been tough because um, social media is one aspect but not all of my clients or customers necessarily use social media. Um, most do, but there's still yeah. some that don't. Yeah. And so then it's a matter of how do I reach those people? Um, I have taken the odd ad out in um, kind of our little local paper for some of the communities around here. And, yeah. and I usually get a few people in on that route, but um, I'm really excited you're actually here because I would love to know um, some of the avenues that might be great for small businesses just starting out where cash flow necessarily isn't um, 
you know, as, as great as it might be down yeah. the road, yeah. but um, maybe that's something I could ask you about. For, for sure. So we'll, we'll have you flip the tables yeah. on me in a, <laughs> in a minute. But I, I would really like to dig into who is your sure. target audience then? Because like you said, some people maybe aren't on social media. So I'd imagine, yeah. you know, like there's some older ladies, but for sure. I think there's a lot of young people doing Absolutely. this stuff too, Absolutely. Right? So, I mean, whenever I say that I own a yarn store, um, most yeah. people just automatically assume that it's that it's older women um, yeah. you know which which certainly absolutely I do get a lot of people who grew up and have knit knit or crocheted or done yeah. needlework or rug hooked or even felting for years so I do certainly have that older demographic um, I'd say kind of even between you know sort of 55 and 85 like that's a huge huge section of yeah. my market yeah. um, also people kind of in um, you know late 20s mid 30s that were taught by their mom or their grandma to knit when they were really young or some kind of craft, even sewing, mm -hmm. but then never really did it. And then are now at the age where they're like, you know what, I'd love to make my kid a costume or something. And they're just starting to get back into that. And yeah. I think that's where the pandemic has kind of pushed yeah. people. Yeah. And then the other market that um, really intrigues me is is the younger generation, um, Generation Z. I'm getting a lot of younger people coming in who want to focus more on visible mending. So rather than purchasing new and, and getting tons of, of uh, clothing that's cheaper. They're Fast actually, fashion. Yeah. exactly, yeah. they're spending more time um, mending their clothes and doing it in a way where it's like the, the term is visible mending, where you're wearing it almost as a badge of honor, which yeah. is really, really cool. That is really um, cool, yeah. So it's quite, you know, a huge demographic that I have. Typically most women, but I do get yeah. quite a quite a few men. I have this one customer I absolutely adore. He comes in and knits his daughter, his daughters actually, outfits and things like that. Yeah. I have another gentleman that comes in and he's he's just gotten into rug hooking and punch needle and is just doing incredible things. So yeah. so it's something for everyone for sure. Well yeah, that's really neat. Yeah. Yeah, so pretty broad, but the the, the core is still then a slightly older woman I demographic. Would, I would say so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that have um you know the ability to shop local. Um I, yeah. I try my best to carry as many local products as yeah, I can. A lot of my yarn is, is Canadian. Um, and then I do carry a lot of the rovings and things for felting that come from Italy. So um, I have a big focus on sustainability, trying to support locals. So it is, you know, there are certain markets for that as well. And um, that does yeah. tend to be that particular demographic for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Now you were also saying in an earlier conversation that you are doing a lot with kids though too. Yeah, right? um, particularly yeah. in the summers. Yeah. Unfortunately, last summer was not necessarily the best summer ever, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I do get a lot of um, parents looking for things for their kids to do just to keep yeah. them occupied. And we had sort of talked about camping, things that you can just pack up easily, sit yeah. around the fire or, or go in your tent and make something. So um, I try to make kits for kids like that. Um, or also we do have classes and we've had a couple um, kids learn to knit classes that have been wonderful. And um, and that's something I'd like to focus a little bit more on. I'm right across the street from the Capilano Library and I'm mm. hoping to maybe reach out to them and do a bit of collaboration perhaps in the summer for that's some a, of the kids. Yeah, that's kids a really things. good idea. Yeah, yeah, so there's certainly, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of things hopefully coming up this summer we can do a bit more for classes because yeah, yeah it, it's really exciting to see kids get excited about the fiber arts for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so your brand new business back in 2020, you're in the middle of the pandemic, yes. which brings its own challenges, but potentially opportunities. What were some of the biggest uh, things that you had to overcome then as a new entrepreneur? Because this isn't, yeah. it doesn't sound like you had a background in entrepreneurship. Uh, you were, no. yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. So my background, actually, I went to university for fashion communication. So my oh. degree is actually in in um, uh, marketing and small business with a focus around fashion. Well, yeah, so this kind of <laughs> so fits right and, in. So health yeah. and safety surprisingly wasn't really my background, <laughs> but long story is when I finished my degree and moved back out west to be closer to my family, I sort of landed in health and safety. Um, and then funnily enough, I spent quite a bit of that time on asbestos, which you can see my little asbestos collection there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's the world's only mineral fiber. So sort of circling back to having a fiber studio and just um, knowing a lot about that particular fiber and um, knowing the science behind a lot of the wool fibers. Like it's it's just been really fascinating for me. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, but coming back full circle. So I have a little bit of a background in, in the design, but that being, being said, it's the marketing that's been probably my biggest 
hurdle is just yeah, trying okay. to figure that out. I mean, again, social media is great, but it's having the time to do all of that is yeah. is my biggest struggle. Yeah, um, because you're pretty much a one person show, right? Pretty much. Yeah. I have an Im incredible employee who I absolutely love and has been just just amazing. Having you know, having an not unexpected baby. I knew it was happening, but yeah. um, but just having that added kind of distraction on top of having a small business. Yeah. Um, so that was that's probably been my biggest hurdle is kind of just getting my name out there. Like, how do you go about doing that? Um, the other thing is just it's been a lot of um, learning as to what this specific um, location and surrounding area, what are people actually looking for? And I've learned so much about what people are coming in here for. Yeah. So what I might think is, oh, this will be a great thing to carry, um, you know, ends up not being as interesting to other people as it might be to me, but yeah. that's been a learning and I'm slowly understanding even colors has been a big thing where people come in looking for, mostly I find earthy colors, lots of blues, lots of greens here. Um, but I mean, it's just one of those things you sort of learn as you go. Yeah, so, so the, the hot pink and stuff isn't, <laughs> it's uh, still, isn't flying I mean, off the shelves. It's not but. flying off as fast <laughs> as the blues and the earthy colors, but uh, but you still get, of course, people coming in looking for that bright pink and just yeah. falling in love with it. So. Yeah, and, and I would imagine, yeah, like from an inventory management standpoint, that has to be probably one of the biggest challenges with any new business, right? Because you don't know what's going to move. You don't know what's hot. You just don't. And the seasonality yeah. of that must also play into it too, Huge right? Huge seasonality. Yeah. I mean, you just, you really, I mean, I did so much research into my target markets and what people might be interested in, and you really just don't know that, you know, that exact sort of what's going to happen until yeah. they start coming in the yeah. door. And I knew that going into the business that yeah. the winter months are certainly going to be busier than the summer. Yeah, when so, people are at home, nothing to do, right? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, gardening, especially in Edmonton, I know people are just, it's gardening season, that's it. Yeah. Like, we're done, <laughs> we're not holding a bunch of wool in our laps, right? Yeah. So it's been um, also a learning curve over the last just about two years, figuring out, um, okay, how can I offset um, the busy months in the winter where I'm just selling tons of wool to the summer where people aren't as interested in. And that's where those classes come in. Mm -hmm. um, I also start carrying more things like macrame, which has made a huge comeback. Um, lots of cottons and things like that that are lighter. Yeah. So those are learnings and I'm still also learning and getting people requesting things. But I, I remember, I so I have to, have to admit, I did a macrame, it just <laughs> occurred to me, um, like plant holder thing yeah. in grade six, I think it was. <laughs> I had a grade six camp and so, yeah, we were macrame these this really cool thing. and. I, I bet you my mom still has that actually. It's it's amazing. It was it was amazing. Yeah, it I, was I like can the, only the, imagine the, the fanciest, <laughs> most amazing macrame plant holder, you know, that you could hang up off the ceiling. Yeah, yeah. I get. Um, well, it was probably all lopsided and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I just get shrieks of of joy and shock um, with a lot of women, especially that grew up in the seventies. Um, doing macrame and just yeah. to see it making a comeback, it's just I love I love that recognition and, yeah. and they're just shocked that it's coming back. So, yeah, that's really yeah. cool. Okay, so now you get to turn the tables on me then. Okay, so marketing you said is one of the challenges. Yes. We happen to know a thing or two about marketing. So <laughs> is there any questions that you would have for me around uh, any, any marketing related um, yeah. challenges that maybe you've had? Well, I would love to know um, as a small business and also as, as a relatively new business, what yeah. are some avenues that I can um, take advantage of, I guess. Um, again, not having the biggest amount of cash flow for marketing, which yep. I know isn't probably what marketers want to hear, but, <laughs> no, that's but what's true. what is kind of, what are the best avenues for yeah. a small business, yeah. um, you know, to, to go down to it, hopefully one day be able to work towards something a bit bigger. Yeah, yeah, so I think uh, one of the, the key things that you want to focus on when you're trying to keep your costs low, right, in terms of marketing is try to figure out what are the least expensive ways of getting in front of people. So social media being, free, that's a great avenue to jump on, right? And so you've done a good job of that. And you have a little over a thousand followers, yeah, I think you were saying? Yeah, about that. Okay, so a little over a thousand people. Now, what you'll find though is only about 10 of those people will actually be served your post. So only about 1% of the people who are following you in Facebook, on Instagram, it's much better on TikTok. And that's why a lot of people are, are migrating or doing a lot over on TikTok because okay. you get a little bit more exposure over there. Uh, but mostly the other platforms, you're 
it's just a tiny percentage of the people who are following you. So you think like, man, I, I have a thousand people. How come I'm only getting, you know, 10 likes on a post or, or 12 or eight or whatever? Oh, well, that is a bit disheartening. <laughs> <laughs> totally, right? <laughs> For all right? the work I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so the way that these platforms are set up is you have to pay to play essentially. And so that's where you're probably getting some notifications from those platforms saying, hey, you know, you can boost this post yes. for five bucks or 10 bucks or whatever. And that boosting then what it does is it then promotes it or places it into your followers feeds okay. so that they will actually see it. And you can even go beyond your followers and get it in front of people who have a particular type of interest or, or um, you know, um, a passion for you know yarn or for right. for knitting or anything like that. So you can uh, identify the different types of interests and get it in front of those people very specifically. So um, what I would recommend then is doing a little bit of boosting along with the posts that you're doing, the organic posts. Okay. Now, how do you know which ones to post if you have a limited budget? The way that I focus uh, a client's budget in that sense um, too is the ones where you're getting some organic um, reach from it. So for instance, if you typically get say five likes, then if you get a post that organically gets say 15 likes or something, then it's like, okay, well that's resonating a little bit more with your target audience okay. than what the other posts are. So that's the one that I'll boost. And the reason why I boost that one is because of the way the algorithm works. So uh, Instagram, Facebook, and so on, what they want their desires to keep people on the platform as long as possible because the longer somebody stays on the platform, the more likely they're going to be able to put an ad in front of them and make some money then because oh, that's okay. how the platform makes their money. Okay. Yeah, so they want you want the person watching as much uh, of the videos or reading as many of the posts as possible. And so if the algorithm is seeing that people are interacting with your content, then they're like, oh, well, that must be a better one. So let's show it to more people because that means more people are going to likely like it as well and s spend more time on the platform. We're giving the viewer what the viewer wants. Okay, so if you see a plot or, or a post that is getting some organic, throw a little bit of gasoline on that fire, so to speak, by throwing a little ad spend behind it uh, because then it just amplifies that algorithmic action that's happening. And then you'll get some paid exposure, but you'll also get some more organic that'll come from that then as well. And so that's where I think you'll get a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. So pick them, you know, Advice, choose wisely yeah. um, and then do some posts or some um, some promoting of that. So stories as well. You said that you do a lot of Instagram. So focus on stories yeah. and the reels. They're yeah. getting better organic lift and exposure that's getting opened up and shown to more people than what just the regular posts are, the yeah. static ones. Yeah. And that is just, again, the algorithm is identifying that people are spending more time engaged with that those types of posts. And so those are what they start to show more and more to. And so you'll see better results from that. Oh, okay. Awesome. So that's really important. The cross promoting that you're doing from Instagram over into Facebook um, is good but what is better is if you can be actually creating a post that's specific to Facebook versus just resharing the ones that are on Instagram now I know you only have a limited amount of time in your day yeah. um, and so that could be difficult so you're doing the right thing in, right now by just cross sharing it but if you do have some time um, just tweak that a little bit because the type of information that you can put in a Facebook post is different than what you can on Instagram, yeah. right? You can put in some links and you can, um, your description is different. The way you tag things is different. Even the dimension of the um, actual image is different too. And so if you can be a little bit more strategic in creating two versions of the same post, then you're going to end up with better, better results or the best possible results off of both of those platforms. Okay. So they're similar, but there's still enough nuances where it does usually pay to, to you know, try something slightly different. Yeah. Um, the other thing around social media that I would caution you on too is that there's a tendency for small businesses to feel like they need to be everywhere. So I need to be on Twitter, yes. or I need to be on <laughs> Facebook and Instagram <laughs> and TikTok and Pinterest. Like, like this would be a very heavy um, or great uh, potential product or, or types of products and services that you're offering here for Pinterest as well. And so it's a matter of choosing which ones are going to be you know, your best utilization of time. And so you, in my opinion, when it comes to a small business, when you're just really yourself trying to manage it all, focus on one or two and just do really great job of engaging there. 
Okay. And by engaging, this is also a really key thing when it comes to social media is that a lot of people uh, use social media as more like a billboard. So I, I push content out, but I don't really engage with the people who are, I'm tr who are in that community of crafters and, and, um, and sewers and, and felters and knitters and so <laughs> on, right? So that community that you have there, you want to engage with it because you don't want to forget you have to be social in social media in order right. for it to work. Otherwise, you're just a billboard and people scroll through it. Right. Uh, they're not going to engage. But if you can start engaging with the, the target audience that you have, follow the, the people who are doing the things that you want to be selling your products to, right? So people who are posting, you know, great stuff about, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the crocheting that they're doing as an example. Well, then, so search for those tags, those terms, and then start following those people. Right. If they're local, uh, start following them, and then you have the ability to then start engaging with them. And if you start engaging on their posts and talking about how wonderful they, the, you know, they, the things are that they're creating, they'll start to follow you back. And now you're starting to build a bit of a community. Yeah, I yeah. love that. So be social. Uh, that's really important. Um, another thing, too, that is the least expensive thing that you can do besides doing free social media is uh, emails, right? So your email list is going to be really important. So build the biggest database you can as quickly as you can. So encourage people when they're going through the till to sign up, right? So get their email address. So you can get them on the newsletter. Um, sometimes it's uh, important or it's helpful to give some uh, discount away to, you know, 10% off their next purchase or something like that uh, in order to get them on the list. Um, so that's really good. In terms of the courses that you're doing, the classes, I mean, that you're, you're hosting and you're having people come in and participating in those, yeah. get them all on the list so that you know then that uh, those people who took a class previously, they might take another class in the future. Yeah. And so you can target to them uh, with free email and then send out regular emails to them promoting new products, talking about new classes, or uh, showcasing different ways of doing things. So teaching them something within it as well would be, yeah. would, would be really helpful. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, so those would be the, the, the best or least expensive things to do in terms of like um, just, um, you know, kind of digital marketing. The other thing is what you were talking about with the library. And so it's yeah. building those connections and collaborations. Yeah. Yeah. As a as a local business, that's a huge advantage that we have over everybody else who's trying to sell, you know, yarn to them online. Right. And so now you have a person, um, you know, that they're connecting with you. You're building that relationship. You're building that community, and that's going to be really, really helpful, I think, in the long term. So it's, it, try to build as many collaborations as you possibly can. Yeah and opportunities to go in and teach a class, so a daycare or a library or a school, um, those are all great, or when it comes to, so that would be for the younger kids and getting them into it uh, on the craft side, but then also I would go into retirement homes, assisted living homes, and yeah. different things like that for some of the older demographic and really try to cultivate those relationships and teaching people how to do it and for so sure. on. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be really useful too. Yes, I agree, for sure. Yeah, the other thing that, I, that just came to mind too, and I don't know how much of this you've done, but you did mention in an earlier conversation where you had kind of like a pop-up where one of your yeah. suppliers came in, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I just started carrying, um, actually, Neat Nick Yarns here. She's amazing. Awesome. She's a local indie dyer. And just on Saturday, she came, set up across uh, across the store here. And, um, yeah, we had a ton of fun. And, and that was a great... Um, uh, time to also advertise my shop, but also her items on social media. So yeah. she was amazing because she would uh, collaborate with me on social media so we could both be posting at the same time yeah. and, and we stirred up quite a bit of interest. So yeah, Saturday was a great day. Yeah. It was really busy yeah. and um, we just had a ton of fun. So so yeah. yeah, I would love to do more of those. I've done yeah. a couple uh, pop-ups in the past with a um, uh, local company as well, but yeah. something I'd love to keep doing going forward. Yeah, and so that collaboration uh, and cross-promotion to your audience and her audience, right? And so you're both benefiting from that traffic and it's related, right? It's yeah. their, her audience is going to be interested in the rest of the things that you're selling. Your audience is interested in what she is doing. Yeah. And so it turns into a really good win-win for both of yeah, you. And so sure. finding that, any other suppliers uh, that you can do that with, and then that kind of bridges into or, or goes into the topic of influencer marketing as well, which you've probably 
heard a little bit of, and it's like, okay, well, there's all these influencers on social media. How does that work, right? Um, and that can be a very effective way of creating then, again, you, um, a little bit more brand reach into other people's audiences. Yeah. Now, big influencers are not the ones you want to chase after. One, they're too expensive. Um, but two, the audience isn't the right audience necessarily because I think a lot of your customers are likely coming into the store and so it's that foot traffic coming in that you yeah, want. For sure. For those, we want more local influencers. Yes. So it's really micro influencers. So these would be people who only have you know, a few thousand people and, are, and their audience tends to be a lot more local in nature here. So those are the ones that you want to uh, reach out to and engage with. And so turning um, those people, so when you start to follow people and identifying like some of your customers in that, um, and even like some of your suppliers, if they have a few thousand followers, then it might be worthwhile reaching out to them and say, hey, do you want to collaborate on something where you know I can give you some, some product maybe at a discount or for free that you'd be able to then use to create something and you just document that in social yeah. media and then that becomes some content that you can use on your social media. It's really important um, to be intentional though with the type of engagement that you're doing with these people. And so reaching out to them in social media, talking to them, cultivating a relationship, maybe sending them some product and then asking them to create something from that and they document that creation process. And then what they would do then is you would have that content that you could use on your site, but th as they're doing everything in social media and showing the, the process of the creation that they're making, then that becomes something that they're tagging you on and you're getting then that inbound traffic hopefully or yeah. the cross promotion of the traffic. So yeah, um, the influencer marketing is something that even small brands can do really inexpensively just for the cost of a little bit of product yeah. or in some cases not even that. So you probably, you know, be able to identify some people who are already tagging you in social media. Yeah. yeah. And then be able to see, okay, well, which ones are, are, you know, have the best following for that? How do you cultivate that deeper relationship? And they might be just keen to get the exposure and help you out at the sa same time, right? Yeah, so for yeah, sure. it doesn't have to be costly at all. Yeah. yeah. So, so those are some inexpensive tips to kind of leverage social media, leverage your email uh, database. But the key to it is trying to kind of think of it all as pieces to a puzzle as opposed to just one individual tactic. So the more that you can layer on, and so looking at your website, what role it plays into it, what role maybe some other types of paid media might uh, uh, play into it, the influencer marketing, the classes that you're doing, the instructional piece, the educational piece, the collaborations, the uh, pop-up stores and so on with some of your suppliers. It, you're just figuring out, okay, well, how do I create that um, and build that all into a unified plan that it all kind of works together. So when I'm doing a class, maybe I'm collaborating with uh, an influencer who's coming in here to actually show us how to do something or maybe it's with the library, uh, right? And so then you're also maybe bringing in a supplier to talk a little bit about some of their product to that class. Well, now we got lots of people talking about it yeah. in social media and really building upon it and creating a little bit more momentum behind what's happening in the moment. Yeah. Okay, so let's turn it back to you then and you get the last word here. So. Sure. What is the best way that people can find you, uh, either online, well, I, not either, both, online and in person? Here. Yeah, um, my online uh, website is littlebluefiberstudio.com. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm here locally. I'm just in the Capilano area, um, just north on 101st Avenue across from the Capilano Library. Yeah. So right there. Um, but you can also find me on Instagram, um, Facebook, and then also, I'm I'm gonna try to do TikTok. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> but um, yeah, but I love people just to come visit me in the store, come say hello, show me what you're working on. That's a huge passion of mine is just to just to be able to see what yeah. people are doing because there are Edmonton has some incredible artists. Like it is, it's yeah. unbelievable what people are doing with fiber, let alone other things. But yeah, it's, the, it's the, amazing. The creator culture oh, is it's, vibrant. It's here in the city. unbelievable. So. Um, yeah. yeah, just, I mean, come visit me. Um, yeah, give me a call and uh, email as well is just 
info at littlebluefiberstudio.com. So, so not too bad. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you, for you taking us. the time. Yeah. yeah. Explaining your story, your backstory. Wish yeah. you all the luck. Thank in the you future so much. You I really appreciate it. Okay. So there you go, folks. Another episode of Amplify Your Business. So if you're interested in watching any of our past episodes, head over to amplifyyourbusiness.ca. And that's where you'll find our full archive as well as any of the future episodes that will be coming out. And also on that page, there is an application form. So if you are a business uh, owner or an entrepreneur who has a great story, just fill out that form and you could be on a future episode of Amplify Your Business. Until next time, everybody stay safe.